uh, I've got uh, a daughter who's 19 and I've got twin boys who are 17 and uh, I'm uh, you know you were talking about your son hitting 14 I'm working from the Mark Twain theory you know what Mark Twain the American writer what he said so when I was 14 I thought my parents knew nothing they were idiots brought to 21 I was surprised how much they'd learned in seven years so if you're working if you're working with teenagers you've already got that going they don't think you know nothing especially when you're a teenager if you've got ADHD on top of that it's a double whammy does that make sense and I make mistakes all the time but what I'm going to try and do is give you some some of some tips of what are things I've learned on the way all right so books are books um, the ones that I would say is there, is there is a good book there's an American book called the defiant child because um, one of the terms that often is associated with uh, ADHD is a term called oppositional defiant disorder ODD anyone come across that you come across that there is a career pathway for people who have that condition they are the defense lawyers of the future or Ryanair cabin crew everyone's got a role but you're not going to get much change out of them so I will mention them as well during the course of the evening um, so learning is the process of sharing information um, that's what we'll be looking at tonight we're all going to be sharing a few bits and pieces uh, sharing some of our successes maybe some of the things that don't work so well um, so if you look at that slide there I should shut up really and let you talk to each other for the rest of the session so that's what we're going to do so I think what well, I'm going to ask you first of all some of you have come here most of you have come alone obviously because you haven't come with partners some of you might know each other from I don't know from being in these things before but I'm suggesting that most of you don't know each other so what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself to the person beside you and use that as a bit of a you know a lead in to say hi and patience is hard, isn't it, when you've had a busy day? You're stuck on the 307 coming home, you've got uh, other pressures, you've got other things going on, and it's all too... It's, it's really hard to retract retract it, you know, some things you come home, you just want to feel, you know, you're tired. But, it, you know, but the most important thing, I always say this as teachers, you, behaviour management, we talk about behaviour management at schools, and the lesson I learned early on was that someone told me this, it said, it's not severity, it's the certainty, and if you say it, you must follow through. Here's the bottom line, if you come home tired on Monday and you say to Jack, do that one more time, you can't have your Xbox for the rest of the week, that's a mistake, it is Monday. You do not want to be saying that on a Monday. You want to be saying that possibly on a Saturday night, but not on a Monday. What are you going to use the rest of the week? And if you say it, you have to follow the through or else don't say it so we're going to give you some tips on that a bit later on what else have we got apart from patience routine absolutely right and let me tell you something what I've learned about working with young people and, and you know and some of you will know yourself but the people the kids who fight structure the most are the ones that need it the most and then they might not tell you they want it and they might give you the impression that they're fighting you, but they actually need it the most. And I've worked with kids mostly over the years who have been in and out of school. I worked a lot in people referral units. I learned a lot from students like that. And um, what I learned was that the routines were, were the things that made the difference. And a lot of kids, when they left us, what they wanted, they wanted the routine to continue. So I worked a lot in people referral units where kids were excluded. And a lot of those kids went to the army or those sort of areas. And people said because they were aggressive. It wasn't the main reason. They went there because they wanted the wrap around structure. So the kids do that. Also, a lot of kids I worked with, by the way, over the years, you know, other areas they went into, if you want to know, cars, cooking construction computers I always say be nice to young people because you never know who in the future might be fixing your brakes so you know the bottom line is is that here's the thing though that school it is not geared for how some of your kids learn and how they work and it's about looking at ways we're going to try and look in without adapting some of those things or getting staff or looking at systems that can do that so what is ADHD? First of all, I think you have to consider it as real. You might not like it, you know, and other people say to me, well, so before, you know, you know, what's the proof? Well, you know, is depression real? Is it real? Why? Where's the blood test? Where's the proof? What we know is we can all be sad, right? We can all be sad, but when your sadness becomes an impairment, it builds up and builds up and it stops you functioning, it stops you getting up, having relationships. It's not sadness anymore, is it? It's something else. 
This is what it is. We look a bit hyperactive, we're a bit impulsive, but if that is persistent, consistent, and Bill gets to a point where it stops you doing other things, then you have something different. So all these things are on a spectrum, but you know, I think number one thing is that it is real. It's not necessarily something that is going to life lasting, but you know, the symptoms are usually are real. And it's regarded as such. Nice or the Nussle Institute of Clinical Excellence. Having said that, 50% of GPs in this country do not, do not believe it exists. And that's one of the issues you have. First door is you're going to go to a GP, he's going to say no. So you've got to go to a different GP. And that's their own organisation that says it's real and genuine. So some of you have been, you know, possibly taken down and, and, and taken down the wrong pathway. The second thing is that's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. They say a range of measures, including educational behavioural strategies, can improve the outcomes. And yeah, we always start off with behaviour and educational. Um, in America, they don't, they don't look at it like that. In America, America, they see it as a neurobiological difference. What they do is they go to medication very early in the process. We tend to do it the other way around. Um, I'm not saying they're right and we're wrong, or, or we're right and they're wrong. I'm just saying different approaches are taking place in different parts of the world. What we tend to look at is that medication is only used, if you like, really for the more severe cases. Whereas in the US, they kind of see it as something if you do that earlier in the process, it, will prob it, it could reduce some of the secondary symptoms occurring. That's what they look at. In fact, in the US right now, families going in for a diagnosis for their kids, and they won't diagnose the children until they assess the, uh, the parents. And guess who's going on the medication first? So, you know, it's an interesting way, isn't it, really? And there is no doubt that part of the reason for that is that genetics and ADHD are quite, are quite strong. And that might be something that, you know, you might be discovering on your journey. I know that when I was in meetings, uh, it was quite clear sometimes to see when mum and dad were sitting there, you know, uh, you know, after two or three minutes of me talking, um, I'm getting a bit of tapping, I'm getting a seat moving back and forth, really. I'm getting people playing at the... You know, it's not meaning that you've got strong traits, but some of the traits are quite there. I know one mum turned around and said to me, it's usually you guys who get the flame for it, by the way, she turns around and says, and one mum turned around and said, I know where it gets it from. I think she's going to blame her husband like she normally did. She said, it's my brother-in-law. So we wrote down family gene pool on that one, really. We weren't quite sure. Okay, adult services um, also need to recognise it. And the reason why we got, you know, the adult services there is that there's some people who have gone through life probably knowing that they were a little bit different from their peers or struggled in school, um, but have done okay as adults. So you don't necessarily, you know, I want to make the point about ADHD. It is not a lifelong condition that's a detriment. It just means a certain points of your life it can make it more difficult for you to be in group situations. Like I said to you before, I can honestly say if I take in the kids or young adults out on a, on a trip where I'm on a sort of beach or we're doing some activity, you know what, I don't see many traits. Where I see the traits are sit in situations like this. And unfortunately, that's how we set our systems up in school, the sitting down too long. And I can tell you early on, I'm a science teacher, right? If I was sitting down, and this was the kids in the people referral unit, and some of these kids have done some interesting stuff, if I'm talking about the periodic table, I'm having a riot. But if I'm, I've got kids with acids, alkalis, flames, and glassware, you know what? A lot safer. A lot safer. But situation we're in right now is that sitting down for large periods of time is, is, what, is what the system requires you to do. So what is it, first of all? We've got three types. I think that's what makes it a little confusing. We've got type one, which is a little bit harder to spot. It's the inattentive type. And for those of you who have boys, well, obviously, who's got boys, first of all? Hands up, who's got boys? Yeah, who's got girls? Yeah, the girls are a little more um, difficult to spot because often the girls have what we call the inattentive type. That's the one. They're hypoactive. They're, they're more covert. They're not overt. You tend not to see it because they are mentally high. And they will get picked up at primary. At secondary, that's when you've got the danger times because they don't necessarily have the same learning skills or the peers. Socially, sometimes they're not quite getting the rhythms right. So that can be more difficult then. But you've got the inattentive. And there's more girls than boys in that subgroup, which is unusual because most SEN, we get it. 
you know, S, you know, ADHD, four to one, dyslexia, four to one, dyscalculia, four to one, you know, Asperger's, four to one. Gentlemen, we die earlier. There's not a lot generally going for us. Apart from we go to a big concert somewhere, we get to go to the bathroom quicker than they do. That's about the only real advantage I can see. But now they're coming in our queues. Have you seen that really? There's nothing sacred anymore. Second type is what you see. It's cool. It's the hyperactive, impulsive type. And that will be obvious because they will be squirming when they're younger. They will find difficulty sitting. They'll be fiddling. They'll be moving. They'll need that constant stimulation. And then you've got the third type. It's called combined type if you have a bit of both. In fact, this is the most severe type, and generally speaking, this is the type that if you have the more severe type, it becomes evident pretty early on. Now, I'm not doing a lot here on diagnosis tonight. It's not really my field. But generally speaking, the symptoms should be pretty clear before the age of seven. And if they're not there before the age of seven and they're afterwards, then it could be other issues that could be causing that. The other guys that are coming along here, it's Peter Hill and uh, Asherton that you mentioned, they'll be the ones who are there pretty much up there and they would be your top two people in the country anyone saw the horizon thing on ADHD yeah. those are the two guys on that so you've done pretty well to get them to come along combined types the most severe type and the bottom line is you've got someone with combined type ADHD pretty early on it's evident they're going to be risk taker they're running in front of traffic they're going to jump out of buildings and you know what the best will in the world a sticker chart isn't going to be enough gentlemen so you're going to have to be thinking about some of the options that are there and I wouldn't say that medication is right for everybody, but I would also say to you that if you've got someone who's that impulsive, who's therefore going to be that much at risk of harming himself or sometimes endangering others, then at that point you are looking at something more kind of like bi sort of neurobiological to support that person. So medication isn't always you know, needed, but if you've got more severe symptoms, then it's one of the things that you should keep a door open to. Don't close a door on it, that's what I would say. I'm very, when I first got involved in this area, I was pretty anti-medication, but I'm not now. I'm not pro-medication, but you leave the door ajar, that's what I think. And if you think it's caused, because this is the problem you'll be getting, you'll be getting all sorts of opinions on this. Because I get it, if people think that behavior is being caused by sugars or by TV or Grand Theft Auto, I get why they're anti-medication. But if you actually understand and believe the fact it's caused by things not working possibly, then use, using the medication option, it makes more sense, I suppose, really. Um, that's your inattentive type. Those are your symptoms there. As I said before, not as evident, not nearly as clear in terms of actually having an issue. But as I said before, mostly drift through primary, not in your face. They're not obvious. Um, more likely to be girls. You get boys, but there are less boys in this subgroup, more girls. The second Second type, you'll know who they are because it could be you and them in a 25 acre field and it will still feel quite crowded. So you will know who they are. Those are your symptoms there. And you have to exhibit the symptoms over a period of six months to be maladaptive and inconsistent with developmental level. Assessments vary so much. Some of you will have gone through that process and will be able to tell stories of having a more detailed one, a less detailed one. But what you should be looking at are other reasons that may cause those symptoms, or at least filtering them out. So it isn't the TV, it isn't the computer, it is something which is in them. Does that make sense, really? And when people say labels aren't important, they aren't for some people. As in my field, some teachers I work with just play what's in front of them. They don't need a label, they just see someone's different, react accordingly. But other teachers, other people need a reason for acting differently. Does that make sense? If they think something's in the child, they'll do it. If they think it's something that you haven't done, their patience towards doing things might not be as consistent as it should be. It shouldn't be that way, but that's how it works. So labels are important, I think, because they, at least people are now saying there's something in the child, it's not something that hasn't been done. Um, so making that point again, it's a real condition. It, we are considering it as, as, as fairly uh, not common, if you like, really, but I don't know, the, the stats are it's about, I don't know, we reckon about one and a half percent of all children are on the spectrum. Okay, so it's somewhere in that category. Um, and we do think it's that. We do know that genetic influences are quite strong. Um, and in some cases, it's, uh, the evidence shows it's, 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 you know, it, it's quite consistent within families. Now, I'm looking at you guys tonight, and I'm looking at overtness, really, and it, you can't 
can't see any. So therefore, a few people will be struggling, you know, in a few minutes because, uh, you know, it's hard sitting down and listening to someone for any length of time, really. But, you know, but the point is that in some people it's more obvious than others. But the genetic element can be an issue, particularly for us within education, because what we're doing in education is we're expecting families to get the same level of support from all families, where you guys have come along tonight because you're interested in, in helping your children, but some of the parents that might fit in this category won't be here tonight because they won't have made the, the, the journey, they won't have allocated the time. And so what I'm always trying to say to, to, to teachers particularly is that, you know, take the burden off parents. And two areas I try and take the burden off parents and education is homework and organisation. That's what we try and do. So, but you might not be getting education working with you in that area. But that's the message I give teachers a lot. You can't make compromises for hitting people in class. You can't, you shouldn't make compromises for anyone using their phone in the classroom. You know, you, you can't allow chewing, you know, that's not that. But not having a pen is not a crime against humanity. So, you know, that's the sort of message I try and give. When it comes to what's causing the symptoms, we think it's fairly um, consistent, it's neurochemicals not working, so when we talk about using medication, it's, it's trying to normalise this synapse area here. This is called dopamine or noradrenaline, it goes across the junction and that's what we think is not working efficiently. And when you use medication, it makes that work more efficiently. It doesn't cure anybody, it allows that person to do things, to hesitate a bit longer than they normally would do. Because that's one of your core, they don't hesitate, it's the impulsivity area that's the big issue. But if you gave someone medication, that's all you did, you know, it's not going to change things that much. You know, if you couldn't play the piano before you took medication, you won't play the piano afterwards, what it might do is allow someone to help you learn how to play the piano. And if someone hit people indiscriminately, boom, 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 and you gave them medication, that's all you did, you know what happened? And they just choose who they hit. It won't stop hitting, it'll focus hitting. It, it gives you a chance to teach them not to hit. Does that make sense really? It doesn't cure, it allows them a little bit more hesitation time. If you want some evidence um, that it exists, some people do, they need the evidence. I, I do a lot, of, again, I do a lot of schools and I know when I go to schools I've got, so say at the end of the day, like I was today, I've got three types of staff in front of me. I've got those that like the quirky kids, and I've got those that really don't like quirky kids, and I've got those that might. And I always pitch at the ones who might, because I'm not going to get everybody. And there's two things that they want. They want me to be showing them some evidence that it exists. And the second thing is they've got to be assured they're not going to get away with it all the time. So those are the two things. And usually, by the way, they're in the PE department. That's where I pitch at them, really. So here's some evidence. That's showing you those without neurochemistry is working properly, that's showing you those with. So there is some neuroimaging evidence that individuals and the wire, wiring is not working in a regular way. So, behaviour. Okay, that, I'm not going to do a lot on the actual symptoms and everything else because I'm presuming a lot of people here tonight would have gone this route, would have been on internet and been on Google. So what I'm going to try and do is give you some practical advice about how maybe to manage situations at home. I'll answer questions about school obviously but here's my first of all pitch about how to maybe manage things at home. Now some of this is going to be adapted from things I've done in schools and some of it's going to be adapted from things I myself have done at home and some of it's adapted from the parent groups I've run in Sutton over the last few years. So, so there's the slide on behaviour and you might be interested to know that the person here who's uh, who came up with this kind of, uh, the first person in to actually talk about behaviour, particularly in school systems, was an Australian called Bill Rogers. Um, he's been around for a long, long period of time. And he says these things about behaviour. He says they're learned, they're purposeful, they're chosen, you know, they've got needs, BDS, change and can be taught. So, you've been listening to me for like 20 odd minutes now, you need a break. You know, or else you, you know, you're going to start fidgeting and getting a bit edgy. So uh, here's a break. So what I want you to do is you set a loads of person beside you. I want you to work through this slide, bullet point by bullet point, and just agree, disagree, or maybe. Behaviour's learned, agree with that? Grispery, maybe. It's purposeful. And also, uh, what do you think the acronym BDS might stand for? Okay. So behaviour's learned, we agree? 
Yeah. Jeremy speaking. Yeah, baby, you, when your first uh, child comes along, you don't really know much. You know, they, when they're a baby, you wait, they, they cry, I suppose, as little babies. They cry again, they get a response. So they keep on crying. So they get a response. They're learning how to get a response. If babies, by the way, get a negative response for six months, you know what they do? They stop crying. So they learn and learning all the time. And we're learning with them, really, I suppose, particularly when you're a new parent, because it doesn't come with the handbook, as you know. And we do stuff that, you know, we think makes sense, but it really doesn't. Like, who here has either organised or been to a first birthday party? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like a general observation. There is no point having first birthday parties. I watched my daughter walk over the heads of all the other children in the room to get to her mother or to food. It's an excuse to have Prosecco or beer. Just call it that and take the presents. But there's a point in a second birthday party because now developmentally they are aware that other people are in the room. But developmentally, some of the kids we're talking about aren't working at the same rate, at the same stage, which is something that we have to put in mind. And by the way, anyone's got more than two kids? You can put your hands up, you've got more than two kids? Yeah. Second kid's going to sue you in the future. Because for the first one, you've got 45 rolls of videotape, and the second one, you've got one and a half, really. So uh, they'll be asking those questions, don't you care? Really. And we had twins second time round, so we've got half a tape, really, which doesn't make any sense. Anyway, first one, you're learning, aren't you? Doing your learning. The second one, you wait. I remember my first one, you know, up and down the hospital a lot. Second one, you know, I remember eating sort of a snail in the garden and I will wait till the next day you know you, you do learn but the point about it is that they are learning at a rate which is developmentally based around their date of manufacture because that's what we do with our kids it's not the most important thing about that child is not is the date of manufacture it's their date of birth we group them on date of birth their expectations are all about the date of birth both socially and academically, you put them in the date of birth. Developmentally, if you're at the same stage as your peers, everything is fine. But if that's not happening, you're not. Now, I say this to parents a lot, and parents get all a bit fuzzy about it, but if you've got a child with ADHD or Asperger's who's nine, they might be nine, or, but technically, in terms of some of the developmental skills, they're like a five-year-old in some. And in other ways, they'll be like a 13-year-old. And that's why the groupings work better sometimes with younger and older. You ever notice that? Because they're not at the same stage as their peers. You've got mates and friends, you don't all go around with 40 year olds, do you? Or 30 year olds, but as an adult you, don't, you get to choose that, you know, and as a child you don't. So socially that's why those things don't always work. So de developmentally, and the point is, it doesn't mean it'll always stay four years behind. But if we keep on using the same tactics we use, it's not just going to widen, it's going it's to get more. So you've got to narrow it. It doesn't stay that age, but developmentally not the same stage. Purposeful, you agree with that? The reason for what we do? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. But there's generally speaking a reason why you do stuff. So what we appear to do is, if you're on the train, and you, sit, you stand up for someone, and they sit down, and they say thank you, you say, all right, I've got something out of that. And if you saw the same person who said, didn't, didn't say anything to you, next time you see him, you think, oh, I'm not standing up for them. We do things for reasons, that's the issue. And some of the reasons that people have, like for example, if you've got kids who, anyone got kids with Asperger's traits or autistic traits? Yeah, you know, if I was going to their door at the same time as the other person, what's going to happen? I'm going through the door. Because I'm not looking for the feedback, I'm looking for to go through the door. The point is you judge people sometimes by your own means and you can't do that because their reasons for doing it are different. That's the point. Chosen. Initially, I mean, the thing with is that you, know, you may start out with a bunch of purposeful chosen behaviours that are about communication information, but if I don't get them, he's trying to, to tell me why yeah. he's behaving. Yeah. All that is in the escalation response. Before I, you know, I can't detect anything from this one, it's just a product of his emotional response. Yeah, and he's not in control of it though. This and this are not in the same stage because develop, you have an expectation. You know, if you had a one year old, you wouldn't expect the one year old to take their turn, would you? But as a three or four year old, you've got expectations of them based on their three or four year old. Well, you've got an expectation of your son or daughter who is how old? 13. 13. 
that he's not 13 in terms of his responses to your situation. He's like a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old. The point is, and the problem with ADHD is they don't choose their behaviour the first time they think about it. See, there is another term out there that you won't necessarily like the sound of, but I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. It's called conduct disorder. Conduct disorder is premeditated behaviour. They know what they're doing and do it anyway. That's not ADHD. ADHD is impulsive behaviour. That's its core feature. First time I think about it, they've already done it. It's not premeditated. And the reason why your sanctions, if you're using sanctions, aren't working is, you know why? Because they're not thinking about your sanctions. The first time they've, they think about it, they've already done it. Sanctions work quite well, though, if you have someone who is premeditated. Now, another word for that, when they're younger, we're not using anymore. You know what it is? Naughty. See, naughty, they know what they're doing and do it anyway. And if they're doing that, then the sanctions have a bit of traction. But if they're not premeditated, impulsivity is the key element of what you're looking at, your sanctions aren't going to work. If you're on the, you're on the road and you notice a speed camera, you're going to slow down. But if you didn't notice it, you wouldn't slow down. Now, as an adult, what we do is we protect ourselves, don't we, from that, because we put in little tricks to help us, little beeps and things like that, really. And by the way, who's been to a speed awareness course, by the way? Isn't it like the worst atmosphere ever? You're in the waiting room and you're all feeling guilty, isn't it? I mean, it's like, yeah, it's the worst thing. I think they're quite useful, actually. I think you should do it. But anyway, uh, I've got a speed awareness course, and there's a camera down in Yule, where I live now. My wife had come back the day before from her speed awareness course, and I had and actually asked her which camera caught her. How bad is that? That's lack of communication, isn't it, really? <laughs> Chosen is not correct, so I'm going to say some kids do choose their behaviour, and if they're choosing to do it, then to a certain extent, that's premeditated. And premeditation sanctions have a role to play, or consequences. But the problem is in schools, we use sanctions for everybody. For those who are premeditated, it's got, for those who are not premeditated, they're not going to change their behaviour. So, so the question is, what will? And actually, what actually does do is rewards. Rewards are more likely to get a response than sanctions. They're more likely to do something for something than if something be taken away. But if you are premeditated, they have a bit more traction. Does that make sense, really? And that's the difference between the two. Information about needs, uh, that's very strong. It's a message. BDS, anyone get it? Have a guess. I never got it when I was asked this. Bad day syndrome. <laughs> now, I was a bit kind of cheesed off with this bad day, so I wanted something a bit meatier, something a bit more kind of kind of stronger. But this bad day syndrome has been something that has stuck with me because I'm going to tell you what it's done for me as an educationalist and as a parent. It helped me a lot manage situations because when he said bad day syndrome, I didn't quite mean what he said, but what I, got, what I thought about was afterwards, as a teacher in particular, there are some kids that I've worked with over the years that they're, um, I see, I guess what I'm saying is behaviour is a funny old term because there's some people's behaviour which people judge it differently. Like you've got some friends, right, that you like, they're your mates, right, but your wife can't stand. Now what is that all about really? She sees something in you she likes, but she's got, you've got friends that, that she can't stand. But why doesn't she see what you see? What's wrong with her when you and her have something on? So her opinion is different from yours. So behaviour, some people, what some people call as interesting, other people see as irritating. Does that make sense? So behaviours are funny, it's quite objective term. So I'm not using behaviour. What we use in schools particularly is we use different terms. You know what we call? We call it mood. We call it mood and we call it management of mood. And it, mood management we call it, just to make it even more fun, trendy. And it is, it's all about management of mood. It's not behaviour management. Three moods you've got to manage, home or in school. I'll give you school first. In school, it's your own mood. Second mood, the mood of a child in front of you. And the third mood you've got in the school is the mood of the others. I go into watch kids a lot, I'm asked to. And all I come back reporting on are two or three others in the class who are winding the one I'm seeing up. Because what happens is when they get bored, that's what they do. At home, you've got three moods. Number one's your mood. When you're in a good mood, you can handle people most days, most well. When you're in a bad mood, that's when you say things you don't mean, you can't back up. Do that one more time, you won't have that computer on for the rest of the week. <laughs> you know what I'll be saying? That. So your mood's the most important. Second mood is mood there. You're going to try and change it, distract it, deflect it, get a different one. 
Third mood, mood of the others. You've got to manage the others, the siblings, who see it's not being fair, he's getting preferential treatment, all that sort of stuff. So you've got three moods. You're in a plane, right? You're in a plane. You've got your two kids here, and you've got, you've got twin one, twin two here. Oxygen mask comes down. <laughs> Who's the pilot say puts it on first? And you don't say your favourite child. You. Because when you're breathing properly, you sort them out. Your mood's the most important one. If you're in a bad mood, bottom line is you don't make good decisions. Now, it's not always easy to be in a good mood, but you've got to be thinking of mood, not behaviour. And when we're younger, we mood manage all the time. I saw a mum come out of McDonald's the other day, two-year-old, fell on the ground, looked at his knee, and went, started going, ah, what's the mum come in and say, don't cry, your knee will be okay in the future, it will replenish because the, you know, they will get together, the red blood cells go, she says, no, she doesn't say, she goes, oh, there's a balloon over there, going, ah, oh, bit of distraction, bit of mood change. Now, I'm not saying, say, to a 15-year-old, there's a balloon over there, but the bottom line is, you might well find that a bit of distraction in a situation like that might go a long way. But you have to look at yours. When you're in a bad mood, you've got to fix it. Well, I've got twin boys now, and when they're playing rugby, I knew before when they were younger, we could tell them, you know, make the man go around my legs, offload it, all that sort of stuff. Now they're older, they're on the pitch, I can't. They're, they're 15, they've got to make their own decisions. One instruction we give them, you know, if you make a mistake, fix it. It's the one instruction we give them. Balls on the ground, fix it. Don't go, oh, fix it. Do something the whistle blows. I say that now to staff I work with. You're in a bad mood, you're not making good decisions with my kids. Fix it. How do I fix a bad mood? Well, personally, I'll tell you my, my tip. Got my phone out. Jennifer Aniston on there always puts me in a better mood. She does. She does. And I'm better off after that, really. So, and we work at mood at home, we'll be talking about the things that can change mood at home. You know what can change the mood at home a lot? You know, animals, dogs. We use a lot, we use a lot of dogs now, pets for therapy, we call it. And I'm not saying you go out and buy a dog now, people say to me that, but you know, you've got to thinking about mood. Mood management, not behaviour, mood. Yours, theirs and the others. I'll be drilling that into you tonight, it's mood. And all the things that are out of mood, distracting, deflection. Think about mood. But you have to think about yours, number one. And if you're in a bad mood a lot of the time, you're going home and you get straight into it, then go for a walk, pet the dog, light a candle, I don't care. Pet your Jennifer Aniston, I don't care what you do. But mood, think about mood. So we're going to think about mood, and we're going to change mood, and we're going to teach mood. And this is the next section. So I've got a formula for you. I'm going to call it SF3R. So it's a bit of a process by which we use to get some traction. So the, the initials are for, are for words. So what, do, what does everybody need? But what do kids with ADHD really need us to provide them with? You said it before a little bit on routines. Another word for that is what? Begins with S. Structure. Structure is the key element. And structure makes people feel safe and secure. I'll give you an example, you know, we don't know what time, we're finishing by the way, let you know, I'll give you an example now, it's, it's, it's five to eight, we're going to finish on the dot of half past eight, right, we're going to have some questions after that, and you know, and then you can stay or can go after that, right, so now you feel a bit more settled now, don't you, you know you leave half past eight, okay, you feel, I've got structure, you feel like, I'm not so edgy, I don't know what time he's going to go on to, you're going to keep talking all the time, you're going to do that. you go on holiday, right, beach holiday, you're going down, breakfast in the morning, you're having your breakfast, what are you chatting about at breakfast? What are we going to do? It's one of the other conversations you have early on. The whole beach. What are you did the day before? Yeah. People generally start saying things like, What are we going for lunch? What are we going for dinner? What's wrong with food orientated or something? No, you just put structure in your day. When you have structure, you feel safe and secure. You put structure in, not structure, the routines aren't done, don't, people don't know where they are. And some people can cope with lack of structure, some people absolutely need it. But when you're going to have it, you're going to have to have a bit of F with it. And what's that? Yeah? Can I ask a question? Yeah. About structure, one thing that we struggle a lot with my kids is, um, if we provide structure and then we have to change it because life changes, then it's immediate. Yeah. So we withdraw from giving the structure. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, you see, that's the, that's the first mistake. When life changes, it's when you need to keep it as tight as you can for as long as you can. Because I'll give you some, some issue. I'll give you some advice about structure. You've got to have some, what they are, I mean, essentially, the structure you're going to put in, I'm going to give you some advice about how you might set it up. Does that make sense? Because what you've got to do is you've got to see a lot of people say they go in with when structure is about setting, I'll tell you what structure is, it's about setting rules and it's routines and rituals. Now, if you've got the rules, it doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter, you, you can't change them. They're the rules. <laughs> They're the boundaries. But often, what you can adapt, because what this word here is, is flexibility. Because people say that's contradictory, it's really not, it's complementary. But if you've got the rules, you can't change them no matter what they react. And if they react in a negative way, it doesn't matter, you've still got to, force, you've still got to, you've still got to battle through it. Because otherwise, it's a bit like the invisible man. If, you're invis if you could go and take something and no one saw you, why would you, why would you not carry on doing it? <coughs> Yeah, at some point, I know this is going to sound difficult, but you're in, the, you're, in, you're in charge of the remote control. You pay the mortgage. You know, they are, you know, they are recipients of your generosity. You have to become a benign dictator in your own home. And at some point, there is a price. There's lines you can't cross. And if it, and some of them get worse before it gets better. But I can t guarantee you this. It's the one thing I'll go. There's a book by a guy called Steve Biddulf. And he wrote a book called Raising Boys. And it's one thing I've taken from the book. He says, boys are asking three main questions. The one, who's in charge? What are the rules? How are they going to be enforced? It makes them feel safe. And when it's not there, they'll take it, but they want to say, girls are asking it too. Well, they will say that sometimes teenage girls, it's why are you in charge? Why are there rules? And give me back my phone now. But let me get to this rules bit in a minute. But S is rules. It's about the rules, routines, and rituals. It's a little bit of parenting style in that. And some people will find this easier than others. And the last thing, it's about putting in some of these things. Now, I'm going, to give, I'm, going to dib in, I'm, going to, I'm going to dib in and dib out some of these things. Some of them you're going to get more work on others. But I'm going to spend a bit of time on this first part in a minute. F is flexibility, and it might well be that you've got some things within that. The three R's, by the way, are rapport, relationships, and role models. And essentially what I'm saying is, is that, you know, if you, if you don't want them shouting, you can't shout. Simple as that. Really. It doesn't mean you want to raise your voice occasionally, but you want them to, you know, that's the key thing. Um, so rapport's getting their trust, and relationships is pretty obvious. Sometimes I ask people what the R's stand for. I sometimes get revenge, retribution. Ritalin does not fit there. It would fit in there. It fits in flexibility, where basically you might want to use other things. So let me talk about rules. They reduce anxiety, in my, my, in my, um, my opinion. They do these things, and also they do, they do these things. But what I'm going to say is, is that setting them up isn't straightforward, and your different techniques of doing it. So I'm going to ask you right now, how do you do it in your homes right now? So I want you to share on this one. So how do you agree the rules and routines in your current situation at home? How do you do it? Off you go, have a chat with the person beside you. How do you do it? And I'll give you some tips about how it might be done differently. Well, some of the stuff I'm going to say, you're not going to agree with, and it won't be applicable to you. And a lot of it will be, a lot of it is just advice. And it's something that I've used both in education and at home. And, but it's, it's been partly down to style and beliefs in, in, in different ways of doing stuff. And the other things, I mean, I've got to do something, I've got to move here, otherwise it won't work. So I was at this course the other day about de-escalation of aggression. And it was basically saying that if you were about to pop, and come at me. This, this guy was trying to say to me that I shouldn't go in with my full body armor on. I look too big. I look too intimidating, even though I'm a munchkin. And I, and I make, I'm, I'm likely to incite you towards coming at me. He was trying to say I should twist. I could turn and go in at the side and make myself look small. If I do this to you, hello. <laughs> it's just creepy, isn't it? Really, I would never do that. I'll never go and twist in that. And if you did that, the kids would turn around and say you've been on a course. That doesn't work for me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I might. Not not go in, I get that, that's not helpful. Body language is important, right? You need to be careful with your body language because the more demonstrative you are, the more you the more you raise the anxiety. You know, and it's quite funny, your body, you've got, you know, look at, you know, that means something else than that. 
It's one little, one, one little pivot, one little change. It means a lot of difference, doesn't it, really? So your body does convey an awful lot of stuff in terms of communication because the rules that you do will have to be enforced if they're, otherwise they're just expectations. They're not rules. Does that make sense? When I, first, when I first went to this school, which was an international school, it was down in Clapham, and I was brought in to teach science and PE and things. And I went there, and it was a, school, a, small, a small school. It was basically, most majority of the kids there were from the US. They were, had from US families. They were families from uh, over here who had kids who were, had siblings of mainstream schools. And I was, this was, the, this was the sort of special needs equivalent for families. So I went there at a school, and we had, uh, the kids were basically uh, quite difficult, i put it that way. They were left, when they were coming into classes, they had their feet on the table, they were telling staff to F off, it just wasn't working. And what we did was, uh, I was given this uh, option of trying to um, change the, the, the attitudes or behaviour. And what I noticed was, when they were coming in, two things they were doing, they were chewing gum, and they didn't wear a uniform, and a lot of these kids had baseball hats on, and they just wore them in and out all the time. So what we did was, I said, well, first of all, we're going to get rid of chewing in the building. You shouldn't have chewed anyway, he said, no eating and I can't wear baseball hats in the building. Well, oh, this caused an awful lot of eruptions. I had the head teacher nearly caved in. He wasn't going to support me. Parents were ringing in saying it was like, you know, taking away human rights. And it was nothing to do with hats. Does that make sense? In the, in the building, you're not wearing a hat. You're in the building, you're not chewing gum. And it was nothing about hats, nothing about gum. But you're in the building, you're in the building. It's a difference. Outside, inside outside, inside. And you can see a hat and you can see chewing. Does that make sense? If you're going to have rules at home, I would start off with ones that are absolutely black and white that you can enforce. I'm not going to say which ones you should do, and I've got some slides here to show you the process, but they're not working. But with, when I work with families and we're working normally, what we say is, let, have some rules, that's some defined rules, everyone does, and they're practical to enforce. Number one, no food upstairs. No food upstairs. It's nothing about food. It's nothing about upstairs. <laughs> it's no food upstairs. No phones at the table. No phones at the table. I don't care what you're on. I, and it's not about phones either. No phones at the table. Have a third one. Three be a maximum. Third one might be, I don't know, no shoes on in the house. It's nothing about shoes. But those are your rules. Once you get those instilled, once you get those developed, once you follow those things through on a regular basis, then you minimise some of the other things. Kids like structure. They'll fight it, but they'll like it. Now, people say, what about no hitting, no swearing? Well, first of all, it's not a rule, <laughs> because you, can't, you don't know what's, what led up to it. You don't know who said something to make him swear. You don't know why he's doing that. It could be, it's, like, it's not a rule. It's an expectation not to swear. But once you, you knock off your two or three things that are actually non-negotiable, they get, they, get, they get the plan. They want actually the structure. They want, it makes them feel safer and secure. But you've got to be able to follow through. And if you can't follow it through, then don't do it. Don't do it. But you've got to decide to do that. And this is where this all works very well, talking to you. But you and your partner have to absolutely come to the same point at which you agree on. And you have to basically agree to disagree. This is where it always works better when you're with, with your partner, actually, because you can't really do this stuff alone. You've got to be black and white in it. If some of you have got families that are split, then again, it's trying to do that in two places. That makes it even harder, but I get. But the same thing is still true. You're not, you're not trying to divide and conquer, but you are trying to give them some safety. That's what rules do. So if you're doing it, number one, decide on three, make them clear and brief, make them positive. You know, um, you know, make them practical to the force, make them visual, you know, pin them up in different places. But the same people have to do it, you have to do it as well. That's the main thing. No food upstairs, gentlemen. No food. <laughs> you know, it's got to be done that way. It starts off like that. Now, it might seem trivial, it might seem like it's petty, it might seem as if it'll never work, but you want to get, people want to feel safe. Safety is structure. Safety is structure. Once you feel safe and secure, other things will flow. So I can only tell you what I've done over the years. And when we've, when we've, and it's been hard work. When I did this hats in the building, trust me, the rest of the staff hated me. Do all the arguments with the parents, the head teacher, I'd say nearly caved. But we held the line for, a, for and we, we held the line. And once we did that, we reduced 
90% of our issues because then they started to come into form. And kids with ADHD in particular like rules. So rituals and routines would be for these things. And, but again, you know, it might be some other areas you look at, but those would be more your routines and rituals. You're not going to get them all working all along. So you can't have a rule, you don't have an expectation about no swearing. And by the way, you don't get any rewards for following the rules. Does that make sense? You don't get any money for following the rules. Them's the rules. But what you do is you do get, you get points and things for this, for this sort of stuff, following this stuff. That's the area. But what you find after a while is that you get more of these things coming into play because they like the structure. Doesn't seem as if it's going to, it's not easy, but I will say it's any change of behaviour is not easy. Anyone given up smoking here? You know, I have. It's not easy. <laughs> It's not easy, you know, giving up weight, giving up drinking, going for a marathon. Anyone done a marathon? You know, run, you know, like, it's not easy. But well, my quick marathon story is this, I feel humiliated. But I ran the Dublin Marathon three years ago when I was 52. And the reason I run it is because my mum's a hundredth and she was 78. And uh, she ran a first one when she was 50, so she started doing all this. And uh, my dad runs too, and uh, I did it in 4.17, acceptable, really. But she did it in 4.13. So next, uh, the Dublin time, it said, Super Granny completes 100th marathon, strap line, and then waited for her son and husband to join her. Uh, so anyway, that's out of the home, in the house. Up oh, in the visual. TV, computer, others. Uh, writing them is easy, keeping to it is hard. But that's the process. Structure, routines, get your rich rules, routines and rituals. Style is going to be how you do it. And that's the second thing, how you adapt it. And uh, your style modify the behaviour they copy and your beliefs will, will do that. And some people believe that this approach to rules is too rigid. Some people think it's not rigid enough. <laughs> some people think, you know, and that, that'll be down to style. And uh, as parents go, you've got three types of style. You want to see? You've got controllers, friends, and benign dictators. You've also got grumblers, optimists, competitive one, chatterbox, oh, just water. Controllers, generally speaking, it's a little bit our approach early on. We try it, it works for us. We think it works in business, it works in business, it doesn't work at home. I've been, I've been working in you know, schools for years. I've been a head teacher of uh, 30 or no, 60 kids who are quite tricky. So I come home, and you know what? I'm just starting all over again. It just doesn't work at home. So you have to be a little bit flexible, but not in this way. So you've got to be not too tight, I think is the point. And you can't just be telling them, you can't just be using consequences, it leads to that. Having said that, you don't want to be the friend either. You don't want to be too friendly. You want to be friendly, but you don't want to be their friend. You know, you are, they are the children, you are the adult. Everyone needs to know where they are on that. And if you're too friendly, it leads to this, it leads to that, it leads to uncertainty and insecurity. So I think children, and if I ask them who, you know, particularly, I won't say who is your best parent, obviously, because they don't like to say that, but I say, who is your best teacher? I ask you, who is your best teacher? I bet it would be something along the lines of someone who was fair, was consistent, someone who was, you could have a laugh with, so he's funny, and someone occasionally who was, who was uh, you know, who was, was, was basically flexible, you know, when it wasn't working, you changed it. So I think that's important. So benign dictator, so your job is to set boundaries, their job is to test them, they'll make mistakes, that's going to happen. Problem is the problem, not the child. You know, you've got to get that, got rid of that idea that he is, a, a, you know, an awkward child. That he, it's just he's different. I mean, I've got twins, right? So I can tell you the amount of comparisons you get with twins are amazing. You know, and I must admit, when kids were difficult at school, I used to think early on that probably was something the parents hadn't done. But now I get it because I get the wiring is different. I've seen them come. And anyone got pet twins, by the way? Anyone got twins? Yeah, because it's an interesting like twins, because they, they are compared a little bit more, I suppose, than other siblings. Fairness is the same one that we need, and you hold children accountable for their choices. You do that, you do that, and you learn balancing. You're a leader and a coach, that's what you are. You're a leader and a coach, but coaching is part of where it goes. Now, at this time of day, I know that you need a bit of movement because you've been sitting for a while. So we're going to get you a little, little movement before we do the last 20 minutes, okay? So, um, so do you mind coming up here for a minute? Just a little game, just to keep you going. Just a little game, watch over thing here. Just a little game, keep you going. Because you need a bit of movement to get you through this last. Yeah. So um, what's your name, sir? Who? What's your name? Sillard. Sillard. Okay, can you put your hands on your back? 
Okay, when I say draw, can you put your hands up with some fingers on display? Any number of fingers. Okay? okay. Right, draw. Right, the winner is the first person to count how many fingers are on display on any hands that are shown available. So you've got, okay, interesting, your choice. So you've got four, I've got two. So the winner is the first person to shout out how many fingers are on display. So the answer is six, four and two, okay? That's all you've got to do with a partner, playing groups of two. You can draw, 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 three times each. First person, shout out, wins the round. Okay, if you want to go back and find a colleague, just get a bit of movement in you at the end of the day. Off you go. And the question was, why did we do this? Well, there's not really any main reason, other than the fact that I know that you guys need a bit of movement. Everyone needs a bit of movement. You need a bit of movement so I can give the last sort of 20 minutes or so. But the other reason I did it was to prove a point. Who won? Who won? Go on. So you won. How did you win? By counting. Counting, yeah. Who else came up with something? Come on. Who else won? Sir? Pure luck. Sorry? Pure luck. Who else, who else developed something pretty early on? Go on. Yeah. I watch people play that game. You say draw. First time, it's like this. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 12, 12. Second or third round, people like this. 11. Yeah. yeah. Because what you do is, when you play in it, you realise, when you do it first time, you know, it's not working for me. You think, hang on a minute, how can I make this work for me? So what you do is, second or third, you think, I'm just going to know how many things I'm going to put up, just count theirs. Now that's not cheating, that's called strategy. My point is this, when you get something coming your way first time, you don't know how to work. What you do the second time, but you learn a bit more. You're not going to learn from looking at slides, what you're going to learn from is interacting with your kids. <laughs> Trial and error. This is not inspiration, it is perspiration, plus a bit of patience, right? Now, I always like the analogy, Gary Player hit, hit that long putt to win a tour, tournament years ago, commentator said, Gary's lucky putt. You know what he said? The more I practice my putting, the luckier I get. And that's how it works. The more you practice, the luckier you'll get. Now, when it comes to communication, how you're going to sell it to them is the key thing. And the key thing is about, is about how you're selling it. And there's no doubt that there's loads of tips on the internet about that. I will just say something about communication. It isn't the words, it is very much the non-verbal stuff, like I tried to show you early on. But tone's important too. What I would, first of all, be is flexible on eye contact. Look at me, I'm speaking to you. Not what you want with kids with ADHD. In fact, if they're doing this, fiddling, doing that, often, they're listening a lot more actively. When their heads are up, too much competing. What well, with the police actually, police have a lot of, uh, don't get training in that, so they pick on someone on a stairwell, look at me, I'm speaking to you, whatever, and that person might have Asperger's, don't, doesn't quite know, doesn't want you to stare at them, and then they cast them by the arm, and they flip them in the ear, and then the rest. So eye contact is overrated. Particularly, if they're outside and they're a bit stressed and anxious and doing a bit of that, I would let them, personally. If you get their eye contact, it's better. But I work a lot in school, I see it all the time. So the kid's chucked out of the class, he's standing out here, he's doing this. If he hasn't run down the corridor, by the way, he's still saying, I'll work with you. Does that make sense? Otherwise he could have gone. So he's there, and the teacher says, stop fiddling, look at me. Well, as soon as he's fiddling, he's not fiddling, he's moving, he's, he's a bit more edgy, because he hasn't, he's not contained, and the arms are moving more. That makes the person in front actually think he's not taking it seriously. Look at me, you've got a bit of ADHD in them, then they might look at you for a bit, then they might look at something else, something's moved, that makes you more angry. Got a bit of ASD in them, not quite sure how you want them to look. So, and they might think you look a bit funny when you look mad. And, and a lot of kids will do that with you anyway. They'll, they'll go, Pfft. and what's that going to do? Is that going to make you happier or sadder? <laughs> it's probably not, and it's going to make you want to kill them, right? So I would say to you, we have this communication thing down to an art, don't we? Look at me, I'm speaking to you. That works for some people, but for other people, you might be making it worse. That's the point I'll make. I'm not saying that you don't get eye contact, I'm just saying that if that's causing friction or problems when you're doing it, flip it, do the, other, do the opposite. You yourself need to be the things there. I like, I know, I need you to. Maybe not can you or will you? No, I need you to. It's got a little bit more traction. You're asking them to do it. 
shouting it doesn't usually work you know it's raising the temperature it's raising the anxiety it's raising the tone it doesn't mean that raise your voice occasionally but if you shout it just becomes noise and they don't really you know it doesn't it doesn't mean you said before you have to be all blessed ah oh, because you've got to be yourself but just generally speaking it's going to raise the anxiety raise the mood you're looking for things to reduce to make them to make the mood better not make it worse if you think you're going to win it by just shouting them out, then carry on doing it. I imagine you're not here because you don't, um, you've tried that, it hasn't worked. So I imagine you're here because you sort of want to do something different. But if shouting works, and it does. But because of that size, it doesn't mean they're going to listen to you. Or that size, even that size, that size. And for them, some kids, it's power. Kids with oppositional defiant disorder, I'll make those kids before, they generally speaking, they're into power and control. And they're getting you hopping around, that, that feeds them. It's what they like. They enjoy it. it gives them... <laughs> It gives them oxygen. Don't know why, but it does. It feeds them. Do the opposite. I hate you. Yeah, sometimes I hate myself. Please uh, finish your homework. Not easy to do, but you might well find you get a different response. Now, this won't, all, won't, won't sit well with you, all of you, but I will say it takes two people to have an argument. If only one person's arguing, it's not an argument. You know, uh, the big I am, ego, I've worked with this in schools. What I learned in schools was when a, when a teacher had, a kid had told a teacher to go and flip off, they were sent to me. I didn't make it better, I made it worse. Because you know what, coming to me made them feel more anxious, made them feel more agitated. Not me per se, but my position did that. And they tell me to F off in front of the rest of the staff, my hands are tied, does that make sense? So we tried, we didn't send them up, we sent them down. Here's the thing, ego, Position does not mean a dot. <laughs> Doesn't mean you haven't got power because you, if they're not turning their computer off, you know, at night time, you've got a switch downstairs which can take out power in that bedroom. If they're taking knives out of your drawers, you've got locks to put on those drawers that you can do that. If you go to your sister's bedroom, you can put a combination lock on there that only, only the, only the, only the sibling knows. You have power, you have control, but you have to think of how, how you best want to use it. But generally speaking, in the, in the interaction stuff, you've got to be a tiny bit cuter. And this is very easy to say and hard to do, which is why you've got to know your own mood. You've got to know your own mood most. Shouting, you know, disappointment better than anger. I suspect some of you were grounded when you were younger, occasionally. I don't remember that. I don't remember when someone that you really valued or really, you know, said, I was very disappointed in you. It's more powerful. Not pay be ready at this phase, but that's the more the bigger sanction you can get is someone you value saying so disappointed in you. But you know, you've got to use some of the other things as well. Um, I got I don't know that one there really. Rewards and sanctions. I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on here a minute because we've got time. The point about rewards and sanctions is that I would say, you know, they're not a bad thing, rewards, and they're a good place to start. Remember, they don't get rewards on um, the rules, they get rewards on the routines and the rituals. And everyone's got a price. That's what I would say, find out what it is. Sometimes it won't be something we want to give. I've got the twins, right? I've got, I got Brennan. And by the way, I wanted to call them, uh, my wife's American, I, I want to be younger, I want to call them Ronnie and Reggie. Um, but uh, my, wife, my wife's big worry was that they wouldn't be able to say their R's. It would be Wobby O'Wegan. But she's American. She had no idea who they were. You know, and I nearly got away with it. Anyway, but one of them, you know, the, uh, one of them, Bren's been pretty straightforward. The other one, P.O.D., has been sorry to say. And our systems weren't working. And my wife said to me, well, you're not giving him what he wants. And what did he want? And he was like five or six. <sighs> and he wanted it. I wasn't going to give him. Because he wanted a Chelsea football shirt. <laughs> now I'm Spurs, my dad's Spurs, we've always been Spurs. You want a Chelsea football shirt, we live in South London, I wasn't going to give it to him. So in the end my wife said to me, well you've got to give him what he wants. Um, so some tips at this point would be, you know, I suppose these sort of things, you've got to outline the expectations, being clear, uh, make sure they know that they're responsible for what they do. They own their behaviour. And I, one thing I would say to parents too is that, you know, kids have to obviously learn early on, if they hit someone, they hit them. It wasn't, their, it wasn't ADHD that hit them, they own the hit, it belongs to them. Same way they own their iPod, or they own, they own what they do. You own your behaviour, because at some point someone's going to call you to account for that. So you, need, you do own what you do, you didn't make a very good choice, but you still own it, it belongs to you. You've got to have to deal with that element 
of ownership of it. Now the problem is you have kids with ADHD, they genuinely will not remember often what they've done after they've done it. So you've got an issue with that, but you've got an issue of reminding them that you have actually recorded this and this is what you saw and this is what happened. In schools it's easier because what we do is we film them in situations where they can actually show them what they've done and then they sort of, they see themselves swearing and fighting and all that sort of stuff and they realise what they look like when that's not very pleasant. So um, you've got a slight issue with that one there. But the bottom line is, is that you know you, you are they, they are still responsible for what they do because if they grow up and think because I've got this allows me to do that, at some point that's going to come unstuck. Um, be consistent, no disruptions, no emotion, not too much talking. Um, when, when we're mad, when they've done something to make us mad, we, you know, we, that's the time when we sometimes do lose control. And if you lose control, we know before what you do is you lose the essence of what you're trying to do. You, you've almost got to walk away sometimes. If you're not in the right place, don't, if it's not life-threatening, don't do it there and then. Does that make sense? Come back and just say, I'm going to handle this later. It's not forgotten, I'm going to handle it later. Then you've got to go straight with dog. Have a, have a Cronenberg in the garden or whatever, I don't care, whatever it is, you've got to manage that area before you do it, generally speaking. Cash and doing it right, price correction and price run ratio, uh, sarcasm, uh, it's not, you know, it feels good sometimes, but it doesn't really work, really. Uh, especially if you've got kids with ASD, it will right over their heads anyway, so there's no point doing it, really. So. Um, Sometimes you've got to save face, you know, a lot of times in schools, and particularly and at home, we force them, we want to make a point. And if you've got a kid with uh, oppositional defiant disorder, they will not do it in front sometimes of the peers, or they won't do it in front of their siblings, so it's not the best time to make a, make a do it in front of someone. Better to do it one-on-one, -on -one, generally speaking, because sometimes they'll play to the other one. I see it, and sometimes in schools it's wrong, but so, so um, um, example, um, uh, Al Alistair's got his phone out in class, and this kid has been excluded twice already, Ready this week, and the teacher will go up and say, "Right, give me that phone." Now, it ain't going to happen because he, she doesn't care what I think. She cares what the person beside her thinks. So what happens is you just end up getting a ruck and you get a chair thrown. Better to say, "Right, put the phone in your bag or on my table." Walk away. What's she going to do? She's more likely you've allowed her to make the decision. So a little bit of a tweak, a little bit of a manoeuvre, but certain people are like that. They need to be seen as making the decision. They won't do it because you tell them they want to save face in the position. Now we don't know why that is, but if that's their style, if you go full frontal and it works for you, keep it. But if it's not working for you, you've got to tweak it. You've got to sort of tweak it a bit. So a lot of kids are oppositional, defiant, they, they tend to have that kind of thing. Um, I said something particularly about computers. They do hold attention. I know they are used sometimes too much and they're used too liberally and they can be cause a problem too. I think to a certain extent with a computer, again, you know, it's how you structure it. And I'm not telling you how to do your homes, but as you know, uh, you know, if they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, obviously they're going to be different time frames you put on it really. But if you say it's on for an hour, it's on for an hour, not an hour and ten, not an hour and five, not an hour and one. <laughs> It's got to be an hour and flip it off or switch it. I hate you. I fucking you know, that's not. You've got to be able to take it. And if you don't do it, it's going to it's going to carry on. That's the issue. And it will be painful. I'm not saying it's not. But you and your partner have to be on the same page on that. And it, in as I said before, changing stuff that's been going on for a while is different. If you've got someone who's got severe issues with anger and ex issues on that, and computers hold attention, it's quite odd, odd really. People, see, kids with ADHD, the irony is, is that people will say, Alice hasn't got ADHD because he can concentrate when he wants to. You heard that one? He can't concentrate when he wants to, he's concentrate when he's interested in what he's doing or who he's doing it with. Putting it simply, they have two main issues. Number one, they don't do hesitation, and that's to do with the neuro stuff, they haven't got the impulse control, and they've got a low threshold of boredom. That is the truth. And pe we can't get this, can't, I can't sell because people say to me things like, I'm not boring. Someone finds you boring, you are to them. What do you have the truth? In schools, it's, class teachers don't get it, they don't get it at all. They, 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 they're boring the kids to pieces and the kids are acting because they're bored. And they take it personally. Because the other kids, see some of you are bored right now. But you've got the ability to look vaguely interested, haven't you, really? Because you're a product of the secondary school system and you've been on other inset day courses. If I look at you searching and you're doing the thing, it always got you through this, don't you? Do this. Yeah. 
And true they actually, when they're bored, look for stimulation, which is why they fiddle and twiddle. And what's the medication you give them? A stimulant. But you get them in the right conditions, you get them doing, you get them carrying, you get them playing, you get them acting, you get them moving, those symptoms are diminished. You know why? Because they're stimulated by what they do. Well, I take kids from a school, special school on forest trees or forest schools, I don't see much AD. I need a bit of planning about them not climbing the trees, but I don't see the condition. When you have them sitting down, computers bizarrely hold their attention. Why? Well, Multisensory, everything's working. Non-threatening, you can go back and forth. Impersonal, they don't yell at her favourites. Might in the future, might turn on and say, leave me alone, you hit my keyboard. It's never, you know, think about it's never really been a, a really positive futuristic film, is it? They're all a bit dark and gloomy and in Detroit, aren't they, really? So they're all a bit dark. So the future, anyway, but they ever write it. Okay, um, pros and cons. I'm going to say something about anger, really. You know, it's one of those things you will get. Um, I, I, you've got this trigger few stuff. I think the most important thing is try to get in early as you can. Mood, mood change, distraction, deflection, anything you can do to reduce it. If it is gone too far, help them make a better choice. You know, sometimes you've got to go for the object than the person and it's going to pick up something. You know, it's very practical stuff you've got to do. If it's knives and things like that, so before you have to go for and lock things up. You've got some techniques, you've got some things out there which are to reduce these things. Number one, though, is, I think, um, you know, is that you are trying to change it. I'm not going to go through all that. Okay, look, look the last slides here, I'm going to, are, are you guys going to get all these slides? Are the people going to get them all? Yeah, yeah. The rest of the stuff here, all of it, a lot of it was talking about people skills, a lot of it was um, just basically saying, yeah, this is what I want to say about arguing. Um, it, you know, just don't get into it. I know there's a tendency to want to do it, want the last word and all that. I've gone through it really, you don't get the last word. <laughs> you don't get, you should do because you're the parent but it doesn't work. So I've just learned arguing just doesn't get me anywhere. Uh, with one of them it does but the other one doesn't. He comes right back at me and he starts grinning at me and doesn't, you know, he just starts just get so it doesn't work. So we don't do that anymore. I would generally say that you know, the, the main thing I've learned is that two North Poles repel. And if you want to get attraction as opposed to repulsion, you've got to go in as a South Pole to a North Pole. Does that make sense? Because two North Poles do that, and a South Pole and North Pole, you get a different option. With ADHD itself, the other people that will come in will talk to you more about, you know, some of the other medical aspects of things. But it's a bit like I said to you before with the whole management stuff at home. Number one, you and your partner need to be on the same page. You need to sit down and decide what are the criteria, what are the non-negotiables, and what are the things that we can work with, can be more flexible on, because he or she is developmentally not at the same stage as their peers. Does that make sense? So, you know, I'm saying this all the time in schools, you've got, you know, if you had someone who needed an inhaler to breathe, that's what you would do, you give them an inhaler. If someone got this in medical, you'd give them something else. So that's a bit quick. I've done, I pitched in there quickly some things we use on this course. I'm sure you've got loads of questions and you've got some things, you've got things to do at school. We'll fire them in now. What I'll do is I'll repeat the question for the camera or whatever, and then hopefully it will be something that it can help things. So it would be nice to have some questions that might be sort of broader ones at early on. And if I want to have some individual ones, I'm going to hang on in 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes left to fire some stuff through. Diet is useful. Um, diet, I would always start with diet with families because I find with families who start on diet, once they start on diet, they start looking at other things as well. Um, sleeping is important. Anything that can affect mood, quite frankly, is important. Isn't food, you know, so mood, you know, melatonin as a medication sometimes for sleep might be really useful. Someone's, you know, not sleeping up too late. You know, the whole idea on computers, you know, they make you sort of, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, is important. So, but melatonin, you know what melatonin is, it's a hormone to help sleep. That sometimes would be very beneficial for certain kids with, with ADHD. <coughs> so your question. Yes, there seems to be a difference of view that whether some people grow out of the development of ADHD or not. 
Mm. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yeah, it's not, it's not about growing out, I don't think. First of all, if you grew out of it, the symptoms, it probably wasn't ADHD. Does that make sense? That's the number one thing. If you're born with it, you will like, what will happen is, the consensus is that as you get older, you learn to manage your symptoms in a different way. The timeline in hyperactivity definitely diminishes as you get older. That's been my experience. But impulsivity, inattention, often can be there to a certain extent. So I think what happens is you learn to manage it, like with Asperger's. With Asperger's, have you got any friends who've got Asperger's like that? Have you got friends? Well, they haven't grown out of it. They just kind of learn to cope with it in different ways. So I would say, generally speaking, if it is ADHD, if those traits are there, you will have them most of your life but you will have learned to manage them and also they'll be less evident because as an adult you will choose options where that fits your style like i'll be honest with you i've worked with some parents who were extremely successful parents okay and who had adhd traits but two things i know and a lot of them i don't want to go to the jobs but a lot very creative very artistic uh, sometimes super sales people what i what, what what was a real common denominator though was quite frankly sir they'd married somebody who was structured, organized, did all the other opposite things. That was a formula I saw a lot. So um, I wouldn't say that it's a fait accompli, that everyone will have the traits to a certain extent, but I, I suspect you will have the traits throughout your life. But don't see it as a detriment. I'll go back to the, my point. A lot of people who have these, has the style, can, can really hit the mark. Asperger's, you know, again, you know, um, I think Mark Zuckerberg's done okay, um, generally speaking, would you say? You know, uh, you find an area in which you, you fit, really. So, the hyperactivity definitely diminishes. Um, uh, but the impulsivity elements often remain. Um, I mean, look, you've seen your local estate agent, you tell me, right? So, that's not working. None of them estate agents here, are they? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, but as you say, it's a little bit, percentages are a little bit weird, 70, 80, I don't know. I would just say that you know, you, you've learned to manage them. But, but really, another way, you do, because the other thing, when I was younger, people used to say, no such thing as ADHD. So, people would say, he or she is immature. What does immature actually mean? It means that he's not at the same stage as his peers. Does that make sense? So now well, he's mature. Mature means you are at the same stage as your peers and your expectation. But if you're immature, you're not. What happens is you mature later. That's what people say. What it is is you've developed coping skills to manage the skills behind at a later stage. Does that make sense? So I think that's what happens. Anybody else got anything they want to fire at me, sir? You said about the rules about the free rules at home. But then you have three rules when you go now. Or yeah, you can, you can. I think the thing about it is you don't want to over, you don't want to overwhelm them. At the same time, you can have obviously that rules at home. You know, obviously you don't adapt in the supermarket or in the car or whatever else. Yeah, but have them so they're black and white, so they're enforceable. Like in the car. It's not, but you know what I mean? It's not about food. Does that make sense, really? It's not about, in the car, no food in the car. It, it, you know, I'm hungry. No, it, it, I'm not saying don't have food. I'm saying don't make that, don't that one. But yeah, you have different ones, different places. Um, I think you also have to be, I, I mean, there's a thing that we always say is about preempting play. Some places are overstimulating for them, though. I would just make that one point. So you, you need to, like, I made a, a, a bit of a quip on this because I know some parents I work with have real problems taking their kids to supermarkets because sometimes supermarkets are overstimulating and stuff. So I said, it's, it's mostly parents with kids with autism. So I said, well, don't go to Sainsbury's, don't go to, um, don't go to, uh, you know, to um, Asda because it's like stuff coming at you. Go to Lidl's because there's absolutely no stimulation in Lidl's. <laughs> and actually, bizarrely, it's working. I did it as a quip, but it actually works because there's no stimulation and it works. Things are piled high and stuff. So, so, but absolutely, have three, have different rules when you're out. Yeah, but make them. But go back. People want to go for broke. They want to go for the no swearing. They want to go for the no lying. They want to go. I get that. You want to go for broke, but it's too early. You won't get that until you get traction. It's like putting roots in. You've got to put the roots in first, then you can start trimming away the other bits. So, but yeah, have rules. Okay. You know, no phones in the car. You know, it's not about phones. It's nothing about phones. 
So they know there is things traction. traction. Uh, sorry? Fresh start. Just a fresh start. What's done is done. You know, we've, we've all learned on the way. I mean, a lot of the time we're making up to go along anyway. Start again. Sit down with them. Have a family meeting when they're calm. Try and get them to help devise their own rules. They're usually more brutal than yours anyway. And not, so try and get them to do it. Get, and then maybe get them to draw it. If it's something's drawn by them, they've done the visual stuff. More. They might not seem you look... They might put things up on the wall and you might think they never look at them. They do. They'll look at them when you're not looking at them, looking at them. That's when they do. But yeah, fresh start. We've all, look, we've all, we're all, you know, I, I, could, I could tell you many, many, a lot more failures. And I go back to the fact, at work, at work, and I'm in a school, we have policies, procedures, things that you follow, safeguard, all that stuff. We've got to, when we go home, the phone's ringing, the music's on, you go, it's just, it's, but to a certain extent, you don't want to run it like, a, like an army, a regiment, but you do have to have those structures in there. Uh, and it is, it is, it takes a while for it to input, it to input, if you haven't learned it before, but I would say, if you also, I go back to my point, Safety and security is whatever we all want, and structure provides that. Really, I know some dads that go fishing, you know, doing that stuff. Really, finding that too, or painting, or doing something together. That's the best time to have the conversations. I think sit around the table very well, but I think you have better conversations when you're moving. You know, that's been my experience anyway. Really.